from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello, and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy, produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eyes Editorial Director. You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast providers. Today's episode is the first part of a two-part series on the Horn of Africa and the role of the U.S. and Middle Eastern actors in the region. Our conversation today will be focusing on the ongoing conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray region, which involves both Ethiopia and Eritrea. In the second part, we'll be discussing Somalia and its recent election. I'm joined today by Nathaniel Gemechu, who's an intern with MEI's Economics and Energy Program and a student at Northwestern University in Qatar. He'll be moderating today's discussion. There is a lot to discuss today, but we're lucky to have two excellent guests on the program and to help make sense of things. This is Khaled Ahmed and Michael Waldemaram joining us. Khaled Ahmed is an in resident scholar with 15 years of experience in energy and power relations in East Africa. Michael Waldemaram is an associate professor of international relations at Boston University's Pardee School of Global Studies with a focus in armed conflict studies. Khaled, Michael, welcome to the program and thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I would like to start the discussion by talking about the current state of things in the Horn. So let's start from the Ethiopia and talk to Michael. And as you know, it has been 527 days since the start of the civil war in Ethiopia. The conflict which followed a follow-up between prime ministers, government, ethnic militia, and the Grice dominant political party has provided an opportunity to settle the scores. Government forces have displaced 2 million and have created a situation where there are hundreds of thousands under famine-like conditions. Michael, could you tell me more about why the conflict started, what the tensions between these two parties would be, and how things are progressing right now? Sure. I think you've asked a big, complicated question. I think the place to start is, is probably in 2018, early 2018, when Ethiopia goes through a very significant leadership transition. And Abiy Ahmed is selected by Ethiopia's ruling party, the EPRDF, as party leader and Ethiopia's prime minister. That The selection of Abiy as prime minister represented a very significant and important shift in the structure of the country's politics. From 1991 up until 2018, up until Abiy's selection, the country's affairs had, for the most part, been dominated by a constituent unit of the EPRDF, a political organization called the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. I know the the acronyms uh, can be a bit exhausting here, but the ruling party was a coalition of four parties, and and the TPLF was one of those four, four parties and dominated the ruling coalition. They had opposed Abiy's selection as prime minister. And I think it's fair to say sought to limit his power, the exercise of his influence in the months and years after his emergence as prime minister. And so, you know, Abiy, for his part, of course, was interested in consolidating power and wresting it from those who had dominated the state in preceding decades. And so, cut a long story short, you have a power struggle between Ethiopia's new leaders and old leaders about who would really be the dominant player in Ethiopia's political system. I think what made the picture a little bit more complicated was that this was not simply a two-player game, but there were other actors and interests in Ethiopian politics who were kind of aligning themselves on different parts of this political divide. So some of this broke down along ethnic lines, but it wasn't purely an ethnic issue. And so there were a variety of interests that have strategically sought to support the prime minister and his coalition, others that have not necessarily aligned themselves with the TPLF, but have shared their critique of Abiy's uh, rule and tenure. And I think there is a very important kind of ideological component to sort of grand political divisions in Ethiopia today. And that ideological fissure is really about the question of federalism and particularly ethnic federalism. So I think the critique that emerged of Abiy uh, from the TPLF and others, uh, a variety of Oromo political interests, was that the prime minister wasn't sufficiently committed to the ethnic federal project. This was a project that had been midwifed by the TPLF in the early 1990s when they emerged as the dominant political player on the Ethiopian political scene. So these tensions uh, that emerge in the context of the transition hit a number of critical junctures, right? So the prime minister decides to get rid of the, the old ruling party, the old coalition, the EPRDF, and create something new, the, the Prosperity Party, the PP. Elections, ostensibly due to COVID, are postponed, which creates a lot of rancor amongst the country's political elites. 
Tigray region under the auspices of the TPLF decides to embark on its own electoral process. I mean, these are all inflection points that ratchet up tension between Addis and Mekele and other actors that are operating on the Ethiopian uh, political stage. Now, in November of 2020, the escalating tension between Abiy's government and the TPLF explodes into full-scale war. And I think we'll talk about the trajectory of that conflict in the coming minutes. But it is important to note that even before this conflict begins in the north, that widespread insecurity and conflict was afflicting the country. So if we go back to the early part of, of Abiy's tenure, I mean, there was an insurgency in parts of Oromia, particularly the west that was fomented and driven by splinter elements of the Oromo Liberation Front and armed groups generally active in in many other parts of the country. So, I mean, the country, I think, was in a state of civil war before the conflict begins in the north, but certainly the conflict in the north took the Ethiopian civil war to entirely new scale. That was very helpful. In fact, I would like you to continue more about this, how the war has progressed, especially in these three divisions before July from July to October 2021 and after 2021, especially with this new ceasefire negotiations. I would like you to tell me a bit more about how the ethnic tensions and the war situation has escalated and came about. Sure. I think the important thing to appreciate about the trajectory of the war is that it has changed in very significant ways, right? There's not sort of like a single kind of trajectory to this conflict. So in the initial phase, The federal government, its allies in the Amhara region, its coalition partner, the Eritrean government, significant participant in the war, really had the upper hand. So in the war starts in early November, I think in the space of about four weeks, they are able to march on the Tigran capital, Mekele, occupy Mekele, all the region's uh, major urban centers and towns, and the TPLF and its military forces, Tigran defense forces, are really forced to escape the sort of rural hinterland of of Tigray, where they launch what would prove to be a very robust insurgency. Fast forward uh, up until, I think it was the summer of of 2021, and what was a really kind of remarkable turn of events, the Tigrayan Defense Forces are able to gain the upper hand, deal some pretty significant military defeats to the ENDF, Ethiopian National Defense Forces in particular, and basically force them to flee the Tigray region. So the TDF reoccupies the capital of Mekele. At that juncture, for various reasons, they decide to launch military operations into neighboring Amhara and neighboring Afar regions. And so again, the conflict takes on a kind of new new dynamic. And uh, those offensives have some success. They still, of course, are hundreds of miles from the capital, but they have fully penetrated these neighboring regions. And I think at one point we're threatening the Addis uh, Djibouti corridor in Afar. Of course, the war also in Oromia is is metastasizing. You know, at another point, the OLA, Oromo Liberation Army Forces and Tigrayan Defense Forces actually link up in parts of the Amhara region and are on some level operating jointly. So the, the federal government and its allies, I think, were under real threat at that point. And then essentially what happens is, and again, another about face turn of events, they are able to reverse the OLA and the Tigrayan Defense Forces gains, apply military pressure on the TDF in particular, and force them to withdraw from the Amhara region and large parts of Afar, although as it stands, they are still active in some parts of the Amhara region and some parts of the Afar region, really in, in the sort of borderlands of these particular regions. So that, I think, is the general kind of story of the conflict. And I think what it points to, and this is what many observers, I think, understood uh, to be the case when the conflict started, is that you know military victory for one side or another was never going to be a real possibility. There really was no military uh, solution to this conflict. Even when one side was able to gain the upper hand, they could really not consolidate their victory. It was rolled back. And essentially, after two years of war, millions displaced, hundreds of thousands of people killed, we have effectively a situation of military stalemate. I see. And this is coming after new talks about ceasefire negotiations. But just recently, there is a joint report with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International about massacres and crimes against humanity, focusing on one region of this conflict, the Western Tigray. Now, this adds long-standing accusations against Abiy's forces, but also other forces in this conflict, including Tigray's TDF. 
But I would like you to talk about what level of pressure there is for Abu Ahmed and for TDF to go into ceasefire negotiations. And also tell me more about the humanitarian assistance that would be needed now. So one thing that should be acknowledged, of course, is that there is an effective humanitarian truce, at least a truce announced by the Ethiopian government. This happened a couple of weeks back. And this is one that has on some level been reciprocated by Tigrayan authorities. And I think, you know, that truce really reflects the stalemated military situation. It in many ways was a product of the military stalemate. Because I think at this juncture, at least this is my reading, I think both sides to this conflict sort of recognize or appreciate the futility of continued warfare. I think that is the lesson they probably learned or gleaned from the preceding two years, a very deadly conflict. And the real question at this juncture is whether this humanitarian truce can be consolidated appropriately, whether humanitarian assistance can reach and will be allowed to reach Tigray and other conflict-affected parts of northern Ethiopia, and whether that humanitarian truce can be used as a springboard or a platform to deeper political dialogue, not just between the federal government and uh, Tigrayan political forces, but also a broader national dialogue between all the various stakeholders across Ethiopia that have an interest in managing the country's affairs and charting a, a political course forward. So that, that is really, I think, the state of play. And I think there are a number of international actors in the West, on the African continent, that are applying diplomatic pressure on the parties to get them to consolidate this humanitarian truce into something sustainable. You know, so, you know, from the earliest days of the Biden administration, there was fairly active diplomatic effort to address the humanitarian situation, to get to a ceasefire, and then to start a process of political dialogue. And there have been some punitive measures uh, put on the table. There have been threats, of course, that have been deployed. I don't think the U.S. government or other Western actors have fully followed through on some of the threats of punitive action, but they have sort of been put on the table, at least rhetorically. I think that's where we are in terms of the diplomatic pressure. And I should also add, you know, you had mentioned overall humanitarian context. I mean, I would say here, the situation is bleak, and it's a particularly urgent crisis. In Tigray today, we have millions of people that are living in famine-like conditions. You know, there is also a health crisis because the health infrastructure of the territory has been effectively destroyed. There are no core public services, electricity, uh, telecoms, no banking. So it's all exacerbating an acute humanitarian crisis. And the same holds true, of course, in conflict-affected areas in the adjoining regions of Amhara and Afar, a tremendous amount of displacement, both in Tigray and in those two regions as well. So there is every need, I think, to consolidate this humanitarian truce and begin a sustained dialogue. Speaking of the international actors you've mentioned, including U.S., but mostly on other actors in Middle East and Horn of Africa, there has been a lot of engagement and a lot of interest in the war both in military funding and push for negotiation. This would be Turkey and United Arab Emirates, but also the African Union, Eritrea, and Somalia. There are so, so many actors going in supporting different parties. What are their stakes in the country right now? And what are they thinking of when supporting or when making donations to these different parties? Sure. Well, I think what's important to to understand here is that I think, you know, we can distinguish between uh, parties, you know, there are different opinions on this, but for the most part are, are playing a, a fairly neutral role. And I think trying to very directly resolve the conflict and the humanitarian crisis it has addressed. And then there are some actors that have involved themselves in the conflict in, I, I guess I would say, a more partisan manner, right? So there certainly are a, a number of players in the Middle East that have, for instance, uh, supported the Ethiopian government's military effort. So one could point to Turkey, at least from the public reports we have, the UAE, who has been involved, I think, in the conflict militarily in different stages. Initially, I think when the war started in November 2020, I think they, they played a role, I think then exited. And then in, in more recent months, they, they have become re-engaged in terms of military support to the Ethiopian government. There were reports of Iranian drones being supplied to the Ethiopian government. A bit more difficult to assess what players from the broader Middle East might have supported or intervened on, on the Tigrayan side. There's speculation out there, but it's, it's more uncertain. But certainly on behalf of, of the Ethiopian government, there have been players from the Middle East that have intervened on their behalf, 
and those sought to support their their military efforts, right? So I just think it's important to kind of distinguish between these different kinds of international engagement. Also, just a word about African players. I mean, there is an AU special envoy, former Nigerian President Obasanjo, and the Kenyans that are very involved in diplomatic efforts to resolve the crisis, address the humanitarian issues, working very much in conjunction, hand in glove, with actors from the UN system, the United States, the Europeans, etc. It's interesting. So the distinguishing definitions you've had between actors who are going for ceasefire negotiations and actors that are funding the war. It's an interesting thing to note. And Nathaniel, I would just add here, just for clarity's sake, of course, the the official position of many of these governments that have intervened in the conflict militarily is that they support negotiations and a political solution to the conflict. But the reality of their engagement, I think, has been somewhat different. So I just think that that needs to be acknowledged. How much power do you think these actors like Turkey and UAE had in the course of the war? Some would say they were key in changing the course of the war, especially around October. Do you think that's an overstatement? This last question is, I think, a difficult one to answer and assess, given the limited sort of information we have on this particular issue. I think there were likely a number of different reasons or factors that drove the military reversals the TDF and its partners faced in recent months. But I do think that external military support was one factor amongst several. I think that's the way I would frame it. Interesting. Good lady, if you have something to add. Yeah, I just want to follow up on Mike's comment about the external factors involved in the Tigray and Ethiopia war. The Horn Africa, Ethiopia, and Eritrea and Somalia, I believe, had set up something called Horn Africa Cooperation, H O A C basically to collaborate on security and economic development and whatnot. But it was mainly for security purposes. And this alliance was mainly created, from what I understand, to be something that is opposite to IGET, which is existing in East Africa, to basically isolate IGET and take over Horn Africa Cooperative between these three countries. And Eritrea, which is involved in the Tigray War, trained and used Somali troops provided by Fromage Admin to be part of this Tigray war. And I think in some cases, the UN uh, reported that they have part of army that committed uh, genocide. So Somalia and Eritrea, the current administration, which is outgoing, and Eritrea are not looking peaceful end to this war. But other actors, for example, UAE or Turkey, as Mike said, uh, militarily or peacefully, would like to see an end to this war. So that is the discussion. I just want to separate between the two of the external parties involved in this war, the ones who are who wants to see peace and the ones who are not interested to see peace. Just to extend uh, or build upon some of Gulud's comments, I mean, I think something I probably underplayed in, in my initial comments, of course, was the role of neighboring Eritrea in the conflict. I mean, it's been quite invested in supporting the federal government's efforts and perhaps collaboration with military actors in the Amhara region. So it is a a core actor in this particular conflict. And I I don't think you can fully appreciate the genesis of this conflict in northern Ethiopia without also understanding the role of an external actor like Eritrea. Just to be more explicit on sort of the question of the TDF and any external support that they may be getting, again, it's much, much more speculative, but I think if there was anyone any actor that was to provide them support directly or indirectly, it would probably be Sudan, right? And the war in northern Ethiopia has, alongside some other factors, been, I think, a significant catalyst in the deterioration of relations between the Ethiopian and Sudanese governments. So I think that's also just a point to underscore. Another key actor that you have mentioned is also the United States, a country that has focused mainly on condemning the government's actions and looking for negotiated ceasefire. But also the government, as you have uh, touched upon, has moved for moved Ethiopia out of duty free trade access and is trying to advance bills that would impose sanctions on Ethiopians responsible for worsening the crisis. But there are two grants and others. I feel like this is not enough. On the other hand, others in the Horn are pressuring the government to diversify the focus away from Ethiopia into other spaces in the Horn, like Sudan and Somalia. In fact, the United States envoy for East Africa, David Satterfield, had left his post only after the third month, and there will be a third appointment on this post in less than a year. 
So is it fair to say that the United States is juggling its responsibilities well enough? Is there more that the United States could be doing? And if so, what would it be? Well, I think part of the challenge for external stakeholders like the United States is just the sheer number of files in the Horn of Africa portfolio that are active and need to be managed, right? I mean, not only do you have the conflict in Tigray, northern Ethiopia, actually across Ethiopia, but you've got the really disastrous state of the Sudanese political transition and and the military reasserting itself in some unfortunate ways in in recent months. You've got, of course, something Gulid, I'm sure we'll we'll talk about, the kind of ongoing electoral crisis in Somalia and the the challenge of al-Shabaab. You've got Nile water issues. You've got Sudan-Ethiopia relations, which are related to the Nile, but go beyond that. One could go, I think, go on and on. And so I think it is, it is a very difficult diplomatic task that U.S. diplomats and interested parties from other parts of the world have to sort of deal with. Could more be done? I think from a U.S. perspective, we're just focusing on the U.S. narrowly. Surely, I mean, I think more stability in the special envoy's position would be helpful and appropriate. Certainly doesn't help to have a very rapid rotation of, of special envoys. You know, I do think that there needs from a U.S. or a, I should say a quote unquote Western perspective, there needs to be tighter alignment, management of the sort of Gulf, Middle East angle in the Horn of Africa. There's certainly positives to this, but a lot of this engagement has not been quite helpful, has been somewhat negative in terms of conflict dynamics. So I think more attention would be appropriate. And of course, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if this current moment is not capitalized on, right, if the humanitarian truce, which I'm cautiously optimistic about, is not consolidated into something sustainable, then of course, external actors have to think about what other measures they can take, punitive or otherwise, to kind of change the incentives of the parties. I just think that's a basic reality. Thank you. And we're running short on time. But before we wrap up, I want to get your thoughts on how you think the conflict would move forward. Sure. So I think the the main priority in Ethiopia right now is to make the humanitarian truce, as it's been called, uh, tangible. And I think that would require full, unfettered humanitarian access to be permitted to enter into Tigray and other conflict-affected portions of northern Ethiopia. Um, I think it would also require normalization of life in the Tigray region, so the return of services, electricity, banking, telecoms, and so forth. I think if those things can be attained, if they can be realized, then there is a solid platform or starting point for political dialogue, negotiations, and ending this conflict. But really, I think priority and attention needs to be given to actually make sure that the parties abide by their commitments around humanitarian aid and assistance. All right. We'll have to leave things here for today. But Michael, glad. thank you both for joining us on this program. We'll see you all next week. That's all the time we have for this week. But thank you, Michael, Guled, Nathaniel. The second part of the Horn of Africa series focusing on Somalia will be available next week. I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for their work on this week's episode. You can follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Alistair Taylor. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.